Hey everyone, Delta here. Before beginning, I want to apologize for the lack of videos recently. I don't really have an excuse, I just forgot about YouTube for a while. But hopefully I'll come back to making more videos now. So to start off this return, I'm going to give them my thoughts about a game I recently finished, I Am Setsuna. To those of you that follow me on Twitter, you're probably aware of my video game backlog. Basically, I collect video games and consoles as a hobby, but that means I have a lot of video games I haven't beaten, or at worst, even played. As a result, I have this huge list of games I've yet to beat, or sometimes ones that I just planned on replaying for one reason or another. One day, however, I decided to start working on my backlog, and finally take out all of those games. And so far, I've gotten a lot of progress. I'll show some of the games I've finished since starting this backlog cleanup. One of these you'll see is the aforementioned I Am Setsuna. This is also one of the games that gave me the idea to make a thoughts video on the games that I've beaten from the list. With that said, you'll probably see a thoughts video on a lot of these games sometime in the future. So with this backstory in mind, I'll show you my thoughts on the game. I Am Setsuna is a JRPG released initially on PS4 and PC on July 19th, 2016, later on Nintendo Switch on launch day, March 3rd, 2017. This game had caught my attention when it was revealed for Switch, but I was stuck. As I mentioned earlier, I collect games, and I am a sucker for having physical copies. There was a problem though, and that was that I Am Setsuna did technically have a physical copy, however it was only available in Japan. Luckily the Switch is region free, so that wouldn't be a problem. So I did end up buying it and importing it for 10 extra dollars. Yep, I'm that guy. When I bought this back in July of last year, I played the game quite a bit. I basically got to the end of the game before I stopped playing for no discernible reason, which mind you is basically what happens to all the games in the backlog. Then about the beginning of July of this year, I decided to pick it back up, since I knew it was only a matter of hours before I was able to cross it off the list. So I ended up beating it a bit later that same month. Wait, I beat this exactly a year after I bought it. Huh, I learn something new every day. No, wait a second, the same thing happened with Wind Waker and Sonic Adventure DX and Pokemon Red. Is this the secret to beating games? Just let it collect dust for a year until you get the sudden urge to play it again? That's actually kind of sad. Alright, that's enough sulking. Let's talk about Setsuna. In the small island of Nive, there's a custom followed by the inhabitants. This custom is about the sacrifice of a single maiden to appease the monsters that wreak havoc among the land. This time, the maiden's name is Setsuna. She must leave on a pilgrimage to the last lands with her guard, in order to sacrifice herself and buy time for the innocent people of the world. Enter Endir, a mercenary of a mass tribe of swordsmen. While finishing off his most recent mission, his client tells him of another job that he wants him to do. He wants him to assassinate the sacrifice. Endir accepts and leaves for knife. While there, he finds Setsuna and attempts to assassinate her, however, she eventually convinced the mercenary to rethink and suggests that he accompany her to the Last Lands as a part of the Sacrifice's guard. And naturally, Endir decides to... accept her request. And the rest is history. But seriously, I haven't played through the middle of the game in about a year, so I can't remember all the fine details. I guess I should go over the characters anyway, since I do know them. First, we have Endir and Setsuna. I basically explained everything about them in the previous segment, so we can move on, right? Next is Eterna, Setsuna's friend. We don't get much backstory on her character until late in the game, kinda like Mia from Xenoblade 2, so I won't go into detail except just saying that she is initially the only person in the Sacrifice's guard. Next we have Nidder. This buff guy is pretty much a loser at first, but is then revealed to be a pretty strong and popular dude. He is said to have been a part of the previous Sacrifice's guard, and is also revealed to be the father of Setsuna. And this little guy is basically the opposite. His name is Kir, and he's a part of the magic-wielding clan of Rarebloods. He did something considered taboo in order to increase his magic power, in turn shortening his lifespan. Lastly, we have Julianne, who is the descendant of a powerful kingdom once said to rule the lands. In order to protect herself and her comrades from an avalanche, she ingested monster blood, making her slowly become hostile in the future. However, once cured by the party, she aids them in order to see her fallen kingdom so she could find answers. Now, I know I said that Julianne is the last party member, but there's actually another one one whom I will not name until the spoiler section of this video. Otherwise, this is the party who will help Setsuna see her journey through to the end. Now I think it's about time to get into the gameplay. If you ask anyone about the gameplay of Setsuna, they'll tell you it's basically like Chrono Trigger, and it shows. The battle system is a great callback to older JRPGs, yet somehow keeps it fresh and new. It's not the most complex, however. 
To demonstrate, allow me to show you how to battle. Jokes aside, if you really feel like getting into all the details of this game, the battles can be very fun and exciting, but if you're like me, then... There are also special enemies, they're called Sprit and I Eaten Monsters. These guys will not hold back, and are probably the only special monsters in any game that deserve that title. Which reminds me, I haven't talked about Sprit Knight. Just think of them like Materia from Final Fantasy VII, it's literally just that. That being said, they do have some interesting magic attached to them, and the combos are also pretty fun to do, as you saw <coughs> earlier. Aside from battles, the overworld exploration isn't too special. The amount of area you can explore is basically directly correlated to the point in the story you're currently at. This means that you're usually very restricted in the places you can visit in the game. That is, until you get the ancient airship, which I named the Reveler. Why? I don't know, it just sounded cool. Then you can fly everywhere you want, including this place. Yeah, no amount of words could explain this, but I'll do it anyways. This village is freaking cool. It's filled with a pixel art version of this village, and it's filled with NPCs who are actually the developers of the game. I was just flying around on the Reveler one day after I got it, so I could see some of the other islands and areas that to explore. You can imagine my surprise when this was what was awaiting me. Anyway, reading the messages left by the devs was a great joy. The pilgrimage is coming to an end as our cast of characters reach the last lands. The castle is covered in frost and ice, and they journey further into the treacherous final area. This place will not give you an easy time. With a total of three save points throughout the entire area, and no way to warp back to the entrance until right before the final boss, you better stack up on items and keep your party in tip-top shape. And of course, do not engage in battle with Sprit and IE and monsters. These guys will one-shot your entire party with lightning magic, and these lovely guys will steal all of your MP and proceed to attack you seven times each before any of your party members are able to attack once. I had to learn that the hard way, but don't worry about these guys, as there's still two-thirds of this place to see. Fortunately, they gave you a save point right before the battle with this reaper guy, which is also a pretty hard battle after he activates the second form. But after that, you finally get to the final part of the final area that holds the final boss. This is where the truth bomb of most JRPGs is dropped. After battling past countless monsters and getting some much needed exposition from Eterna, you meet the woman known as the Time Judge. She explains that Eterna is part of herself, before challenging the party to a fight to see if they are ready. Once they went, they are told that this woman wasn't allowed to leave the Last Lands, as she was the one holding the barrier against the Dark Samsara, the monster in charge of the chaos. Therefore, she made Eterna so she could explore and keep track of the outside world. However, fitting to her name, she is the only one who holds the Time Terrible Sprit Knight. Using this, she has rewound time every time the party chose to sacrifice Satsuna. That all changed this time, when things turned out differently than anything had before. Monsters became stronger and more intelligent, but most importantly, the appearance of Endir, the Reaper, and the decision to fight the Samsara. The Time Judge disappears, and you get the final party member, Fidas. He's the Reaper from throughout the game, except nicer. Honestly, I didn't even use him as he was way underleveled. It almost looks like he was just shoehorned into there, and it's pretty unfortunate as there was a lot of missed opportunities for this character. Anyway, this is where you finally get the option to skip back to the entrance. After that, however, the party heads into, uh, this thing, so they can fight the final boss. So this is the point of no return. The inside of the Samsara's realm is where the party faces some of their past foes, showing their weakness. Now all that's left is the Dark Samsara himself. Unfortunately, this battle is pretty much a pushover. I may have overleveled a bit, but still, it was way too easy for me. Luckily, that's not the end. It is revealed that the Dark Samsara was once a young man who was experimented on by Julian's ancient kingdom. He was drained of his magical energy until he regained it, turning more powerful each time. Eventually, as his humanity was lost, he became the Dark Samsara. Backstory aside, upon his defeat, he travels to the past in order to prevent his destruction. He doesn't have a time sprint night though, so he had to follow a trail that was left behind. Do you know what that trail was? It was all of the times you saved the game throughout your adventure. 
This was a pretty good use of the your saves have consequences trope that has become a bit overused as of late. After this, Endir and Satuna travel to the past as they are the only ones who could see the save points. They traveled through a past version of Nive Island at the time when the previous sacrifice was sent off, and follow Samsara to the place he met Satsuna. After fighting the Samsara's human form, Satsuna traps him in her body, and Endir carries out the mission he was asked to do at the beginning of the game. Beating this game, I was pleasantly surprised at how good it was. I remember seeing Lost Fear, Setsuna's spiritual successor, and thinking, these guys seem to be just making a ton of similar games that probably aren't that great. However, that was before I finished I Am Setsuna, and while I've not played Lost Fear, I would guess it's at least as good as this one. The story of this game had a good plot focus, and it really did a good job of hooking the player. That being said, the mid game is not as great, for fairly obvious reasons, which is probably why I got bored and stopped playing. On the other hand, the combat was a breath of fresh air, but after realizing I could just... It just became a hindrance to the otherwise amazing game. The graphics are pretty decent, and the aesthetic is beautiful, but again, after a while, the areas start seeming repetitive and they lose their charm. The music was the best part of this by far. The entire score was made using just the piano and sometimes percussion, which makes it really nail in that cold, desolate land feeling, plus making it feel sad or fast-paced were both possible and sounded great. One of my biggest gripes was that they gave you choices that didn't amount to anything. Maybe some different dialogue from other characters, but nothing consequential. The characters are another thing I had a problem with. All of them have cool designs and some nice personalities and backstories, but they never really expand on a lot of them. They seem interesting at first, until they all become the same ally who helps the protagonist on their journey. Overall, I would recommend this game, but I would want to warn you that it will probably get boring eventually, so just keep at it and your time will be rewarded. Also, keep in mind that you will most likely have to grind for levels on more than one occasion, so if grindfests aren't your thing, then just try to do your best to fight all the battles you come across, and really make use of that weapon strengthening option that I'd never use until the last minute. It seriously helps to max out all those stats. But that's enough out of me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.